Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Gurudev to Srila Prabhupada and to all our Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. Finally, I offer my pranam to all the Samuel Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. famous pastime of the churning of the ocean of milk, how the demons were cheated and five incarnations of the Supreme Lord, Kurumadev beneath the mountain, Lord Vishnu above the mountain, Ajit churning along with the Devatas, Danvantari and finally Mohini Murti. So, Last time is very colorful and interesting. But one may think, uh, there are material literatures 
like war and peace and other mm, the Iliad and the Odyssey and different types of classical literatures they have more interesting plot or anything like this one I think yeah. so be careful don't compare the transcendental leader of the Lord with any worldly activities because actually this pastime illustrates so many profound philosophical points <coughs> no author no human author has been able to even touch those points even raise the questions in regard to these points it is such a wonderful thing so this evening we want to analyze the themes and the questions and the answers which are raised by this very Leela. There are two ways we can do it. There's a short and easy route or the long and more demanding route. Which way would you like to go? Um, so that's a typical answer for those who stay here in Ananda. They like the long route. That's very difficult. They don't want an ashram where you just get out of the car and step into the ashram. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> then I request my dear brothers and sisters, pay attention very carefully. Though you have to work a little bit this evening, the rewards will be immense, innumerable, immeasurable and priceless. So, in this pastime, the Supreme Lord is descending in so many avatars and participating in some event taking place within His creation. So a question arises, what is the mystery behind creation? It's a good thing to know because here we are. What is this world and why does it exist? Why do we exist? Why did God make it? What is time? These are the cardinal questions actually of philosophy. Very difficult to answer. But in the course of this Leela, and the course of the 7th canto, 8th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadev Goswami is addressing all of these questions which seem to not, that no one can really answer them. But he answers them in a most satisfactory and scientific and philosophically rigorous way, which will transform your, your moment by moment experience of life and the way that you see God and the world. So, this question comes. Leela, that means play, that cannot be the cause of creation. Hmm? Why? In the third canto, Vidura, he expressed this to Maitreya Rishi. Huh? In the third canto, chapter 7, text 3, Vidura said, a child is impelled to play by his own desire or by the desire of another child. Hmm? So, how could this be so for Bhagavan? Because he is fully self-satisfied and he is detached from everything so he can't be impelled by hmm, another person. So this is the Purvapaksha. This is an argument. Leela cannot be the cause of the creation of the world. Because play, something that children do because they have some desire or they are impelled by someone else's desire. So, if Bhagavan is Atmaram, fully self-satisfied, then why would he have any activities at all? Hmm? What's the point? If Bhagavan is complete, he is Purana, Om Purnam Madha Purnamida, then why will he have any activities at all? Hmm? And even if we grant you the concession that 
All right, let's say he wants to play, but why would he play with his inferior material energy? He has his spiritual world, he can play there forever, what's the point of coming here? Hmm? Why will, surely he would just play with his Swarup Shakti, his internal potency. This raises other questions. Does Bhagavan Sri Krishna himself appear as the avatars in the course of maintaining the universe? Or, and when he comes, sorry, does he not side with the demigods over the demons and kill the, the demons in battle with them? So, now, if he does, if he takes the side of the demigods over the demons, and we heard that he did, then that must mean he's influenced by the gunas. <laughs> right? Because who are the demons and de demigods are those personalities who are predominantly sattvic and demons are predominantly rajasic and some tamas, like that. So only a person who's in the gunas discriminates between the gunas and chooses this one or that one. Shukadev Goswami walks around naked. Hmm? If he sees some naked girls playing in a river, he's not disturbed. He doesn't see a difference between Larki and Lakri. In Hindi, in Hindi, Larki means a girl and Lakri means firewood. So when Shukadev Goswami walked past some girls who were playing naked in the river, they didn't even cover themselves because they could see he was just, he was beyond all duality. But when Vyasadev came, then they hid themselves, they became embarrassed. Huh? That is there in the first canto. So, if God coming here starts to take sides with one or another, and this subject of partiality is a big thing in the Bhagavad Gita, it's raised again and again. Hmm? And it's really, really important that you deeply understand this subject of the partiality or the impartiality of God. Which is it? Because if He shows partiality, now, he's in the gunas. You see, this is very important for persons who are meditating on Brahman. Because they know the absolute truth is nirgun and beyond all the dualities of this world. They cannot entertain the possibility for a moment that if God is nirgun, that he would be involved, take sides in a conflict taking place within this plane. Why would he do that? Hmm? So, if he takes sides, then he's influenced in the gunas. And he would be subject to the defect of partiality. That means bias against the wicked and favoring the pious. So generally when people think of God, they think, yeah, well, that's God, right? He favors the good people and he's against the bad people. Hmm? But such, isn't it, doesn't everyone think like that about God? Hmm? If you're good, God likes you. If you're bad, he doesn't like you so much. right? But what conception of God is that? A nirgun entity would never think in that way. Hmm? If everyone's a soul and God favors the pious over the impious, that means he's not even hmm, Pandita Samadarshina. You know, setting Gita, a learned person sees with equal vision a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. Huh? That means that God is not even seeing your soul, he's seeing some gunas which are temporary covering, coloring you. And now he's liking you or disliking you because of that. How could God possibly be like that? But for the general people of the world, they all see God in that way. It's a complete anthropomorphic projection. And because actually in, in, in our tradition, God is very narrow, very human-like, it's very easy for us to get caught up inadvertently in anthropomorphic projections on Krishna, who is actually completely near God. So this, this discussion of this pastime is going to make you question your own conception of Krishna and God in a really, really deep way. In fact, you may experience this evening some internal earthquakes. So be careful. Because there is a chance, just a slight chance, that not all of you, but some of you may have some Tattva Brahm. A little bit of philosophical misconception hiding there somewhere. Uh -huh. And if you are experiencing duality and affected by duality, 
then it's 100% definitely true that there's some Tattva Brahma in there. Because if one understood Krishna Tattva, then at once, Janma Kama Chame Dibhyam Evam Yodveti Tattva Taha Chaktva Diyam Puna Janma Neti Mame Krishna said, for one who understands me in Tattva, my birth and my activities, not when he gives up his body, but as soon as he understands it, he comes to me. Gyatam drastam chatattvena praveshtan cha parantapa In the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, by this you will know me, you will see me, and you will enter into my divine existence. So to, to know Krishna means to enter into his plane of existence. One becomes transcendental just by knowing him. So if we're not transcendental, we should conclude that actually we don't know him. This, in Tattva. So now, it's been established that duality or partiality could, towards pious or against the impious, simply cannot be a characteristic of a Nirgun entity. Is everyone clear with that? Okay. Now, now the answer is this. Why would a person who's Atmaram do anything? Especially with the material energy. So the answer is, it is true that Bhagavan does nothing at all to sustain the universe. What? Huh? We're just hearing Janmadya from whom the creation, maintenance and destruction comes. No, it's true that Bhagavan does nothing at all to sustain the universe. He manifests his various avatars and leelas in this world exclusively through the display of his Swarup Shakti. So even though it looks like he comes here, he never touches this world. Now we've heard this morning how he's interacting with demigods and with demons in this Leela. Right? So the demigods are sattvic and the demons are rajas. But now we're hearing, actually, he never touches this world and he, and he interacts exclusively with his Swarup Shakti. So how is that possible? Because it certainly seems he's just coming here and interacting with the gunas and people in the gunas. So, the Supreme Lord manifests His avatars and His leelas in this world exclusively to give pleasure to His devotees. In the Padma Purana it is said, Supreme Lord says, Although I am able to annihilate all the demons in just one second by my mere will, still I come here and I play. Why? Man bhaktanam vinodatam karomi vividakriya. Dashna jana samsparsha matcha karma vihanga gamaha. Mad bhaktanam vinodatam. Just to give pleasure to my devotees. Karomi, I do vivida kriya. So many different activities. And I give pleasure to my devotees in three ways. Just like a fish, a turtle, and a bird. That is by darshan, dhyan, and sparsha. A fish takes care of its young. When the young come from the eggs, the young fish, the fish swims around and looks at them. And the turtle lays his eggs on the shore and then swims in the ocean. And deep in the ocean, he waits there and, and meditates. She meditates on the eggs. And they're maintained in this way. And the bird sits on the eggs and the young hatch and the mother bird is just right there touching them, keeping them warm, taking care of them by touch. So in the same way, the Supreme Lord appears in this world and, he's, and He gives pleasure to His devotees, sometimes by His glance, sometimes by His touch, and sometimes He's far away from them, but He's meditating on them. That's a separation leelas. He's remembering them. So, Kunti Devi said, Tata parahamsana muninam mamalatmanam bhakti yoga vidanatam katam pasyema histriya. In the prayers of Queen Kunti, she said, Oh Krishna, you yourself descend to this world to propagate the science of devotional service into the hearts 
of the advanced transcendentalists. Hmm? So this is also confirmed here because Kunti Devi is saying that there are devotees in this world, they are advanced and he comes for them and he inspires them to progress further in bhakti. In the third canto, also it is said, Anugrahaya Bhaktanam Anurupatma Darshanam and also in the tenth canto, in the Rasalila, Anugrahaya Bhaktanam Manasam Dayam Asritaha Vajitei Tadashi Krido Yastrakrat Parobhavet So several places throughout Bhagavatam, first canto, third canto, tenth canto and also we gave that verse from the Padma Purana the conclusion is that the reason the Lord comes here is just Madbhaktanam Vinodatam just to give pleasure to his devotees so everyone is saying it. Vyasa Devi is saying it. Shukadeva Goswami is saying it. Kunti Devi is saying it. Hmm? Lord Brahma says it also in the, his prayers in chapter 14 of the 10th canto. Beautiful verse. Prapancham nish prapancho pi vidambayasi bhutale prapana janatananda sandoham pratitum prabhu. It's a this is a great verse and actually Sanat Goswami includes this verse in Bhakti Rasayan there's a special rasa in it as well not only Tattva it's um, 10, 14, 37 Prapancham Nishpapancho Pi he comes in the Prapancha the world made of five elements though he himself is Nishpapancha beyond all the elements Vidambayasi means he uh, like a trick he imitates Vidambasi he imitates Bhutale in this world the activities of an ordinary human being Prapanna Janata and those persons who are surrendered to him, Ananda Sandoham Pratitum Prabhu, just to give condensed ecstatic mm, joy to he, those who are surrendered to him. Mm, that's why he appears. So, now, the question comes alright, we accept that the Supreme Lord, it's not someone else, but he himself comes in different forms. And his purpose is to just give pleasure to his devotees. But how can we say that when he comes to this world, that the Leela is exclusively a display of Swarup Shakti, when quite clearly we see him interacting with beings who are Sattvic, Rajasic and Tamasic? So, the answer is, in the third canto, Lord Brahma said, Esha Prapana Varado Ramatma Shaktiya Esha prapana varado ramayat vashaktya yad yat karishati grihit guna vataraha tasmin sa vikrama mitam srijato picheto yunjit karma shamalam chayata vijayam. He said, The Supreme Lord is the benefactor of all the surrendered souls. I pray to Him that I will not be materially affected when I am performing this duty of creation. You see, Lord Brahma has to interact somewhat with the mode of passion in order to do the Visarga, the secondary creation. Right? So Lord Brahma is praying, My Lord, I pray that while I am doing this, I will not be materially effective. I pray that my mind will always be absorbed in your Leela, which is enacted through your Ramayatma Shaktya through your internal potency, Rama Devi. So here, Lord Brahma essentially he's saying that I have to deal with the gunas, but if my mind is always engaged in your Leela, then they'll not affect me. What does that mean? That the entirety of the Leela must be near Gun and of Swarup Shakti. So this is the Praman that the whole Leela is of Swarup Shakti. So, now we have heard that the Supreme Lord comes to this world to yada yada hi dharmasya, glani parvati bharat, abhyutanama dharmasya, tadatmanam sri. When dharma is going down and adharma is going up, he comes and establishes dharma. So, puritranaya sadhunam, to deliver the sadhus. They are the devotees. So that's Madhbhaktanam Vinodhattam. But also Vinashata Juskritam 
killing the demons is actually part of maintaining Dharma. Huh? Because the, the demons are adharmic. Right? Now, Dharma is just Sattva Gun. Dharma, regular Dharma, is just Sattva Gun. And the demons who are against Dharma, their Rajasik and Tamasik, he kills them. So it looks like he's coming and dealing with the Gunas and maintaining the universe. Don't think so. He doesn't do that. Or rather, he does it, but he does not make any effort whatsoever to do it. That it means it happens automatically. He only comes to this world for the happiness of the devotees and the work of sustaining the universe, <laughs> taking sides with the suras, annihilating the demons. That all happens anusangik, just incidentally. So we can give an example. Actually, Jiva Goswami gives this example. There are some devotees and they have Krishna Prem. So they want to experience more intense Prem Sukh Ulas, the expansion of the joy of Prem. So what do they do? They decide to have a Bhakti festival. Hmm? So those devotees who have experience of Prem, who have experience of transcendence, they organize a Bhakti festival. And they want to have expanded experience, realization, give pleasure to Krishna and really relish Prem. Now to have this Bhakti festival, it's necessary to have some good musicians. So they call some drummers, some expert drum players and they tell, please come to the festival. Right? So then the drummer comes. But these drummers, they have no clue about Krishna Prem. They don't have any realization or anything. Uh, right? But they've been invited to play. So they come, and those Premi Bhaktas, they have a big Sankirtan. And in that Sankirtan, go locate a Prem Dan, Hari Nam Sankirtan. Narad Muni Bajai Bina Radhika Ramana Nami. Nama Yamani Uditai. When the holy name is chanted, then Radha Raman appear there, and they're relishing the beautiful pastimes of Krishna through the medium of the Kirtan. So, now, At that time, when they're singing and dancing, they destroy the inauspiciousness of the world. And all the people who are there who don't know about Prem, even those drummers, they also get benefited. So in the same way, the Lord does not have to descend to maintain the universe. Maintenance is anusangik. It's a concomitant, incidental effect of the Supreme Lord's playing with His pure devotees. But, at the same time, the auspiciousness is spread around the world and the regular people, they're also benefited. The universe is maintained. Dharma is established and that Dharma is destroyed. Another example is given. Let's say it's winter time and it's very cold and you're hungry. So you light a fire in the kitchen to cook. Now your purpose is to cook, but incidentally the kitchen becomes warm. Right? So the coldness goes away. So your purpose was to cook. But as a side effect of your cooking, the kitchen was heated and uh, the cold went away. So in the same way, hmm, the Supreme Lord, He comes to this world exclusively just to play with His devotees. But incidentally, when the wicked make a problem for His devotees, to give the devotees pleasure uh, and to serve them, uh, then He kills the wicked. So His killing of the wicked he doesn't come for that. It just happens in the course of his pleasing his devotees. Hmm? So, now, alright, the person, the Purva Bhakshi, the opposing argument, person who is giving the opposing argument, he says, alright, then I accept that the Supreme Lord, he doesn't interact with his external energy. He just comes for his devotees and plays with his internal energy. He doesn't maintain the universe or anything, but he does it. It just happens naturally as a consequence of his primary reason for appearing. But why does he bother to come to please the devotees? Why does he act at all? Because a person can act for two reasons. One, because he lacks something. If you lack something, so you act. And two, if you're full of delight, you may just do something out of a natural exuberance. 
So for the conditioned souls, everything that they do is motivated by the desire to fulfill something which is a deficiency in them, something which is lacking in them. Hmm? But Bhagavan, he acts just out of his pure joy and to share that joy with his devotees. So, then someone will say, all right, I accept. Bhagavan is only acting to give bliss to the devotees. And the devotees act to give bliss to him. So what does that mean? That means that he is not self-satisfied and the devotees are not self-satisfied. Because why are they trying to give bliss to each other? They must be dissatisfied. <laughs> so then, Oh, and another question. Hmm? Oh, that's it. So, now the answer to this question is, pure devotees have bodies which are imbued with Vishuddha Sattva. Shuddha Sattva Visheshatma Aprema Suryang Susambhyabhak. They attain bhav. So, being filled with Vishuddha Sattva, which is the Samvit and Ladini Savriti. It is the essence of the function of Krishna's spiritual consciousness and joy potency. Therefore, the devotees have no insufficiency. They don't need anything. They are completely satisfied because their heart is full of that bhav, that ecstatic potency. So, bhakti, pure love, is the desire to please the object of your love. Therefore, Krishna's desire to please his devotee and the devotee's desire to please Krishna does not prove that they are not self-satisfied, but it proves that they are self-satisfied. Because only a person who is satisfied in himself can act solely for the pleasure of another person. Right? Because if you're not satisfied, when you act for someone else, you're not solely acting for their pleasure. You want to get something for yourself. And therefore, that the devotees only act to please the Lord, and the Lord only acts to please the devotees, doesn't prove that they're not self-satisfied. It proves that they are self-satisfied. Mm -hmm. Because only a person who is satisfied within himself can act without any selfish motive solely to please someone else. Therefore, love includes Atmaramata. Atmaramata doesn't necessarily include love. A, a, a Brahman realized Rishi, hmm, then he's Atmarami, he's self-satisfied. But that doesn't mean he has ecstatic love for the Supreme Lord. So, now, If Krishna did not act to please his devotees, that means if he were not inspired by their devotion, then rather than the fault of not being Atmaramata, but rather he would have the fault of Akritagyata. Yes, ungrateful. He would be ungrateful. The devotees dedicated to him fully. If he didn't respond to that, then he would have the fault of Akritagyata. Akritagyata. Kritagya means gratefulness. So Akritagya means ungrateful. Now, furthermore, the devotion of the devotee which gives pleasure to the Lord, that Bhakti Shakti is his own Swarup Shakti. And therefore, even though the devotee gives pleasure to him, he's still Atmaram, self-satisfied, because the Bhakti which is pleasing him is his own Atma Shakti, his own Swarup Shakti. As well. So, we see that when Durvasa Rishi was being chased by the chakra and it, no one could save him, Brahma could not save him, Shiva could not save him and he went to Vaikuntha and fell at the feet of Lord Narayan and said, please save me. And Lord Narayan said, no. And he told the Durvasa, actually, I can, he said, you can stop the chakra. He said, no, I can't because I am not independent. I am controlled by the love of my devotees. Then he said, Naham Atmanam Ashase Madbhakta Sadubhi Bina Sriyam Chattantikim Brahman 
Yesham Gate Aham Para. He said, Without my devotees, for whom I am the only refuge, I don't want to enjoy the happiness of my own transcendental form or even the happiness of my opulences. So beautiful. Without his without the love of his devotee, he doesn't want to enjoy the happiness of the spiritual world, his opulence, or even of his own spiritual form. So this indicates that this ananda, this spiritual joy of Swarup Shakti, it has two forms. One is called Swarupananda and one is called Swarup Shakti Ananda. So Swarupananda is the happiness of the Lord's own form. His form is Sachidananda, so naturally he feels happy. <coughs> He's made of condensed happiness. Hmm? So that's Swarupananda. But when his Ladini Shakti, the Ananda, comes out from his body and enters into the heart of the devotee, that's called Swarup Shakti. So the Shakti which comes from the Swarup and which is non different from the Swarup is called Swarup Shakti. That's the definition. So that Swarup Shakti in the heart of the devotee, we call that Bhakti. Now when Krishna experiences the happiness of Bhakti, the devotion of his devotee, then that happiness he feels is called Swarup Shakti Ananda. So his own internal happiness, Swarup Ananda, and the happiness he feels coming from the, his devotee is called Swarup Shakti Ananda. And also his Swarup Shakti is manifesting his opulences and his abode, that also gives him pleasure. That's also called Swarup Shakti Ananda. So the, to distinguish between the two, the happiness that comes, the Swarup Shakti Ananda that comes from his Aishwarya, his opulence of his abode, that is called Aishwarya Ananda. And the happiness that comes from the devotee is called Manasa Ananda. Hmm? Because it pleases his heart. Manasa Ananda. So in this verse, Nahamat Manam Asa say, all these types of Ananda are described. Okay? Nahamat Manam Asa say, I don't want the happiness of my own form, that's Swarupa Ananda. Right? Sriyam Chantikim Brahman, I don't want the happiness of my opulences, that is Aishwarya Ananda. Hmm? And when he says, without my devotees, that is Manasa Ananda. So in each of the three lines, first three lines of this verse, Swarupananda and the two types of Swarup Shakti Ananda, Manasananda and Aishwarananda, there's one line dedicated to each one. So it's very, Bhagavatam is like this very precise nectarian explanation of all tattvas is there in the, in the flow of the loving words of the Lord. So, now the question whether Bhagavan is Atmaram, self-satisfied, or his devotees are self-satisfied, that has been answered. Now we need to answer the question of partiality. Is the Lord partial? Is He biased? Is He subject to favoritism? Because even though this universe is full of countless millions of living beings, He comes here exclusively just for His devotees. So that's partiality. Right? We have to answer that question. So the answer is this. When a person acts to please someone else, then it's for two possible reasons. Number one, you see, when you act to please someone, there can be two possible reasons for that. Hmm? The first reason is because you want to get what you want from that person. Hmm? And then the other reason is to fulfill that other person's desire or to mm, achieve their welfare or their benefit in some way. Okay? Now, we're talking about partiality. These are the two possible reasons why one would act. Now, is there partiality in these two reasons? Now, the first one, we can say there's no partiality at all. Why? Because a person who tries to please someone to get something from themselves has no partiality to anyone because his sole motivation is himself. Eh? So he didn't choose you because he's partial for you. He chose you because you've got something that he wants. Right? So it's nothing to do with you or you or you. There's no partiality at all. They cannot be. That person has no partiality because he's just acting for himself. 
So he doesn't have partiality in relation to others. So now, and because the Lord is apt to calm, all his desires are fulfilled, then he's got no reason to want anything from anyone anyway. So there's no gain for him. So now we come to the second reason. Now this is a, opens up a big subject. An astonishing, wonderful subject. And just try to hear it very patiently and calmly. Because, you know, if you eat something, if you don't chew it, sometimes it can get stuck in your throat. We don't want it to get stuck in your ear. Hmm? It, will, it may require an adjustment in the way that we think. So you have to do vichar, deliberate upon it very carefully to understand the truth of this point. The desire to act for the welfare of someone is what? Compassion. You feel compassion for them. So you want to? Thank you. Feeling compassion for me, she told me. Put on your chatter. The temperature is dropping. Everyone wrap up warm. So the desire to act for the welfare of another person is compassion. So what we need to do now is make a study of the psychology of compassion. Hmm? Have you ever thought about it? Because we, we use this word lightly. Hmm? Mercy, compassion. Kindness. The Lord, hey Krishna, Kurna, Sindho, Dina, Bandho, Jagatpati. Huh? So, we want to go into a study now of the psychology of compassion. What is compassion? Compassion is a chitta vikar. It's a transformation of your chitta when the heart is touched, seeing the misery of another person. Mm -hmm. You see, the chitta, mm, that is uh, the most subtle part of our psychological body, which is very sattvic, is composed of mahatattva, it's very responsive. Yeah? And that when the chitta expands, when there's an expansion or an illumination of the chitta, that is actually an experience of happiness. When we, we're in a situation and something pleases us, we feel a kind of lightness, a kind of internal illumination, and, and an expansion of our consciousness happens. Huh? So that is the prakash, or the ullas, of the chitta, that is happiness. And when we're in a situation which gives us distress or pain, then we feel a contraction of the chitta. So this expansion and contraction of the chitta is what we call happiness and distress. Now compassion is when you see the distress of someone else and it affects you, it causes you to feel distress. Your heart is moved by their suffering. Like that. And you, oh, and you feel their suffering. And that's compassion. So compassion is a chitta vikar when your antakaran has dukkha sparsha. There's a dukkha sparsh, the touch of suffering in your antakaran, in your internal sense. Antakaran means the internal sense, that is the subtle body. So now, consider that this compassion is not possible in Krishna. Why? Because, first of all, Pleasure and pain, whether your own or, or feeling someone else's pleasure and pain, are modifications of chitta. And chitta is the first evolute of prakriti. It's a material element. And because Krishna is aprakrita, that is beyond prakriti, supernatural, therefore Krishna is never touched by prakriti and he has no experience whatsoever of material happiness and distress. Consequently, because he has no experience himself of happiness and distress, he cannot be touched by happiness and distress. Therefore, it is impossible for Krishna to be moved by compassion for those who are in worldly distress. It's actually, for the general person, this point is emotionally repugnant. Right? 
It's emotionally repugnant eh? for, the, for the general person. Why? Because they have no tattva gyan. But we've just gone through the stages, step by step by step, philosophically showing that it's absolutely impossible for Krishna, the Supreme Lord, to, for God, to be moved by the happiness and distress of the people of this world. Because it's a chitta vikar and Krishna and it's prakrit and Krishna is a prakrit. So Krishna is Satidananda Bigraha. He's the embodiment of bliss. So he has no experience of material uh, he has no experience of the material misery that we call pleasure. Actually. What we are calling pleasure is actually from the absolute point of view just miserable. Because it's a it's a it's a modification of prakriti. Hmm? So he has no experience of material pleasure. What to speak of material suffering? Even. Or rather, no experience of suffering, but he has no experience of material pleasure even. Because he's beyond that. We can understand it by the example of Atyantika Bhav. That means the extreme and absolute non-existence of darkness in the sun. Huh? Go to the sun planet. Is there any darkness there? Are there any shadows there? It's impossible. So in that person who is the son of Ananda, it, can there be any misery in him? Can there be any material happiness or distress? It's impossible. Hmm? Now, someone may raise the argument, but wait a minute. I have heard that God is Sarvakya. He's omniscient. So if you say that he doesn't know about our misery in this world, then how can he be omniscient? So the answer is this. First of all, this argument produces a, um, a philosophical situation which is known as Gata Kudyam Prabhatam. Gata Kudyam Prabhatam. Which means uh, the experience of spending the whole night taking a long circuitous route to avoid the ghat, to come to another part of the river and cross there, so that you can avoid giving a tax to the tall man. But you spend the whole night going, taking a long route, a diversion to avoid him, but in the morning when you arrive at the river, the taxman is standing there waiting for you. <laughs> you understand the example? Yeah? There's a place where you have to cross and there's a toll. And the person is going to take tax from you. So I don't want to pay that toll. So you take this long detour to cross at another place. But in the morning, you're traveling the whole night. And in the morning when you arrive there, the tax man is standing there. Why is that? Because we've just proven that Krishna being a prakrita cannot have any experience of suffering. And now you're saying, well, he's omniscient. So even though he has personally no experience of suffering, because he's the Paramatma in the heart of everyone and he sees what everyone is going through, then he doesn't personally suffer, but he has the experience of other suffering. Like that. But now what happened, you're just like the person who spent the whole night avoiding the torment and ended up bumping into the torment. Because even if he sees their suffering, because he himself is Satchidananda, then his heart cannot be moved by that because compassion means that you also um, vicariously experience the suffering of that person and then your heart melts for them and, and you feel compassion for them. So you've ended, you've ended up, you took another route, you said, yeah, he, he doesn't feel any happiness or distress, but indirectly he feels it. That's meeting the taxman again. Because even if he sees it, he's not going to be moved with compassion because he just cannot be touched by the vikar, prakrit vikar. It makes no difference whether the suffering is, his, is your own or someone else's. In order to feel compassion, you have to be touched by it. Your antakaran has the dukkha sparsh. And that cannot happen to Bhagavan. Now, someone may object that in that case Bhagavan is not omniscient. 
He's not Sarvagya. He doesn't know anything. Because he doesn't know suffering. Right? And the answer is, no. He is omniscience. But the absence of suffering, seeing the suffering of others, does not limit. And the fact that he cannot experience suffering does not limit his Sarvagyata, his omniscience. Why is that? Hmm? There are two things. Dukkha Gyan and Dukkha Anubhav. To know, to know what is suffering Dukkha and to realize what is suffering. Dukkha Gyan and Dukkha Anubhav. These, yeah, to experience actually being in a state of suffering. These are two different things. So, <clears throat> for example, the absence of darkness in the sun does not negate its effulgence. So, Bhagavan is full of the uh, consciousness, he is composed of consciousness, and the absence of suffering in him does not negate the fact that he is a fully conscious being. And conscious of everything. For example, the Paramatma is in the heart. And the Paramatma sees your Chitta Vikar. You subjectively experience that as Dukkha Anubhav. And he sees it completely. You, do, The general person experiences misery, but they are not even aware that it is just a contraction of their Chitta. Hmm? So the Paramatma actually knows all about your suffering more than you. Because he's actually seeing everything. Hmm? But he doesn't have the subjective anubhav of being in misery. So in this way, he's omniscient and he knows every last detail of the mechanics of your suffering. Right? But he doesn't subjectively actually have any misery. Like that. So he has dukkha gyan, but not dukkha anubhav. So the fact that there's no misery in him doesn't mean that he's not omniscient. Rather, the very elements which are contracting and expanding, which you call happiness and distress, distress they are him. Because he is also the ingredient cause of existence. Huh? Right? Janmadya seya yatanvayad. Yatanvayad means the Lord himself is the, he is the elements. Because there is no difference between Shakti and Shaktiman. So the very elements which are contracting and expanding, they are actually Him. So you cannot say, well wait a minute, He's not omniscient because He doesn't feel misery. No, He knows the precise mechanics, the precise mechanisms of happiness and distress. And the very elements that you are experiencing, by which you subjectively experience happiness and distress, they are non-different from Him. And therefore, you cannot say that he's not omniscient. He knows everything in complete minute detail. However, he has no subjective duk anubhav. He has duk gyan. He has duk gyan, therefore he's omniscient. But if you'll demand that you'll have to have duk anubhav, then what does that mean? That means that you're demanding that God be in Maya. You see? Because what is Dukkha Anubhav? You have to consider this from a higher standpoint. There is the Atma. And the Atma is transcendental. He is Satchidananda. And then there is Prakriti, the material energy. Right? Now the question is, where is suffering? Is suffering in the Atma? Or is suffering in the material energy? So suffering is the contraction of the Chitta. So that's in the material energy. It's not in the Atma. Right? Now, the material energy is Jad. It's dead. He has no feeling. Right? And the Atma has no expansion and contraction. So where is suffering? Nowhere. It's not anywhere. But the idea that suffering exists is just that the jiva is identifying with the movements of prakriti and that misidentification with prakriti is called maya right the jiva is actually never suffering he's never in bondage even 
The chitta, where this so-called happiness and distress, contraction and expansion is going on, is dead. It doesn't feel anything. And the jiva doesn't expand and contract. So he's immutable. Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, jiva is immutable. Right? So where is suffering? Hmm? What is actually suffering? Nothing. No one is suffering. Nothing is suffering. Because the energy where suffering is has no feeling. And the person has feeling. He's not undergoing any expansion and contraction. And so, the Dukkha Anubhav, the experience of suffering, is just Maya. It's just illusion. Due to identification with Prakriti. So, the living entity who is demanding, no, no, God has to have some understanding of suffering, is basically saying, why can't God be in Maya like me? Right? But God is not in Maya. So Srila Bhakti no Thakur says, Atmani Vedana Tuva Pade Kori Hainu Paramasuki Dukha Dure Galo Chintana Rohilo Chaudi Ke Ananda Deki Oh my Lord, since I surrendered my soul to you, I've become completely happy and in all four directions, everywhere I look, I see only Ananda. When the darkness of Maya is removed from our eyes, we have no Dukhanubhav. No suffering at all. And when we look everywhere, we'll not see suffering because we know that the Jiva is not suffering and the material energy has no feeling. But the, the saint who remembers previously being touched by Maya, just like a person who has a dream and then wakes up. And there's just a little shadow of that dream. He cannot remember it exactly, but there's a slight shadow of it in his consciousness. So the sadhu has become enlightened, has a slight memory of what it's like to live in the plane of misery. And because of that, when he sees those who are not enlightened, he feels compassion for them. And this is why mercy doesn't come from God to the conditioned souls. It comes from the Vaishnavas. So when you understand this, then we can understand what is Guru Tattva and Vaishnav Tattva and why it's necessary to take shelter of Guru. Because Krishna doesn't feel compassion for the fallen souls eh? who are not devotees. There are two types of fallen souls. Eh? Like this, Ainanda Tanuda Kinkram Patitam Mambi. Oh my Lord, I've fallen in this ocean of material existence. That devotee is in the stage of a Sakti. Right? So he's not an ordinary condition. He's fallen from his own perspective. But he's not a conditioned soul in the sense that one who's turned away from God. So Supreme Lord doesn't feel, he cannot feel compassion for the suffering of those who have turned away from him. Who feels compassion for them? The pure devotees who have risen above Maya hmm? and remember something and they look upon them and feel compassion for them. And that is why and then when they pray Vaishnavera Avedana Krishna Daya Moya Ehenopamara Prati Habena Sadoy Srila Bhakti Nautako said when the Vaishnava prays to the Lord on my behalf, at that time the Lord's mercy comes to me. Hmm? So Krishna's mercy only follows the mercy of the pure devotee. Otherwise Krishna doesn't know about us. He knows about his devotee. Krishna said, I don't know anything except my pure devotees and they know nothing but me. But Krishna said, did say, Sadhu be grasturidyo Bhaktar Bhakta Jana Priya. Hmm? The, the devotees have captured my heart. They are dear to me. And the devotee of my devotee is dear to me. So only when we become connected with someone who is connected with the Swarup Shakti, then Krishna's mercy comes. Because Krishna only relates, interacts with the Swarup Shakti. And therefore, Sadhu Sangha, Guru Pada Shrai, Vaishnav Kripa, Without this, the living entities have no chance at all. No chance at all. Now, this is a, another extremely important point. Someone may object. I find this to be emotionally repugnant. And in my life, I make all my decisions. 
not based on Shastra or statistical facts, but on feelings. Hmm? So, there are many people who make their choices based on their feelings. All the facts have been placed before them, but they still act on their feelings. So, all the facts of Shastra, the evidence of Shastra has been given, but still one may object. So now, we're going to give some Pratyaksh Praman. Direct evidence in your senses that you can see right now to prove that Bhagavan has Dukkha Gyan, but he has no Dukkha Anubhav. And that it is impossible for the Transcendental Supreme Lord to feel compassion, compassion for the misery of conditioned souls in this world. Impossible. And we don't like to hear but now we're going to prove it by to your senses because it said seeing is believing right seeing is believing hmm? so Bhagavan is called kartum akartum anyata kartum that means kartum he can do anything akartum he can undo anything or not do anything and anyata kartum he can even do things which are contradictory in nature because either you do one thing or another, but you can't do both when they're contradictory activities. But Krishna, he can do everything, he can undo everything, he can not do anything, and he can also do contradictory things. And also, see Krishna is Parama Karuna Moi Shiramani. That means he's the crest jewel of all of those who are filled with compassion, who are full of mercy. Parama Karuna Moi Shiramani. Now, Because Bhagavan has no Dukkha Anubhav, we have, to say, we have to conclude that he has no realization of the misery of the living entities. Then there's no fault of cruelty in God. Right? The world is full of people suffering, struggling and everything. Why doesn't he do something about it? This is a whole you know, department of philosophy called theodicy. Theodicy. If God is good, why is there so much suffering and bad in the world? Right? So the the Bhagavat the Bhagavatam's answer to theodicy is so deep, and that's what we, we're going through now. The theodicy of the Bhagavatam. So because Bhagavan has no Dukanubhav, he has no realization of the misery of the living entities, therefore we cannot say he's cruel. Right? All the misery is going on. If he doesn't do something, he's cruel, right? No, he's not cruel. That's the proof that he has no idea. Right? There's a proof. Because he can do anything at any time. Just his will makes anything happen. And because he's compassionate. If the Lord had direct Duke Anubhav, realization of the suffering of the world, because he's all powerful and, in, and he can do or undo anything, he would immediately deliver everyone. Right? So my question to you is this. Are we all still here or not? Huh? Are all the people of the world still here or not? Is the world full of suffering people or not? It is. Right? But He's all powerful and He's all compassionate and we're all still here. That's the proof that He has no Duke Anubhav. Right? Look, we're all still here. That's the proof that the God has no Duke Anubhav. Because one, he's compassionate. Two, he can do anything. So if he had Duke Anubhav, we'd all, we wouldn't be here. Right? We'd all be delivered. Right? That's a Pratyaksh Yes? So if he's all compassionate, but he can't feel compassion, how does that work exactly? Aha! Uh -huh. This is a great question. No. He cannot feel compassion for the, do, for the material suffering, which is a the contraction of Prakriti. Hmm? So he's all compassionate. But his compassion is transcendental. This is one problem. When we talk about the qualities of God, like he's nice. God's nice. He's soft. He's kind. He's merciful to everyone. What we're actually describing, all these qualities, they're all sattvic qualities. Right? And then we're projecting these qualities of Sattvagun onto God, even though we say that God's near good. Transcendental love or material love. So, but the point is.
point is here. When we say God is compassionate, our idea of compassion is seeing someone suffering, we feel sorry for them. Right? And that's a, a quality of the mode of goodness. So now you're saying what Mayavadis say, that Bhagavan is actually just the highest manifestation of the mode of goodness. It's not really near good. And therefore, you just get back to up to the point of liberation and then you throw away God because that's just the gunas and Maya. God himself is illusion and then you enter into Brahman. Right? So it's, it's of course, we're not that, it's not that aggressively against God, but it's an element there that when you think of compassion, you think of a quality of the mode of goodness and think that that's God's quality. Like that. So this is what we're addressing this evening, that our our awareness or our understanding of God is not really Janma Kama Veti Tattvataha. It's not in Tattva. Because we we are harboring many material conceptions related to God. And so this Qatar is going to clear them out. But just wait a minute, just hear a little bit more and the little the gap, the gap that you're asking to be the filled, it will it will come. Because he is compassionate. But his compassion is aprakrita karuna. It's a divine transcendental compassion. It's not the sattvic compassion that we conceive of and can project onto God and then involve God in our dualities. So, <coughs> now, so the last point was the proof that God has no dukkha anubhav is that we're all still here. Right? We're agreed on that. Uh, now, in the light of this understanding, we can say that there cannot be a fault of partiality towards non-devotees. Let's say there are some non-devotees and one's enjoying and one's suffering. So God is not going to take the side of one over another because He has no experience of happiness and distress. Right? So God has no partiality in relation to the non-devotees. So if He has partiality, it has to be in relation to the devotees. Hmm? Now, yes, Krishna does have partiality in relation to the devotees. Huh? He does respond to the happiness and distress of the devotees. Why? Because the happiness and distress of the devotees is not a prakrit chitta vikar. It's not a material transformation of chitta. The happiness and distress of devotees is of Swarup Shakti. When the devotee can please the Lord, he feels joy. And when there's some obstacle in pleasing the Lord, he feels distress. Just like Chaitanya Mahapu sent Rupa Goswami, go to Brindavan and discover the lost deities. So he came there, Sanatan Goswami discovered Madan Mohan. But, Sana, but Rupa Goswami was looking here and he couldn't find Govinda anywhere. And he sat down and he was doing Brindavan Parikrama. And he sat down on the Parikrama and he was crying. <laughs> I can't fulfill the desire of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> huh? And just then a boy came to him and said, Oh Baba, hmm? Mahatma Ji, have you seen a wonderful thing? There's a hole at the top of this hill and a cow comes every day, stops over the hole and milk pours out of the hut, udder and goes straight into the hole. It's really that strange. Look, come with me, I'll show you. And the boy took him there and he saw a cow came and stopped and milk came out. Then he thought, oh, what's, what must be there? And then the cow went away and he looked around, the boy was gone as well. And then Rupa Goswami began to dig and there he found Govinda Dev. So who was that boy? It was Krishna himself. Had come in another form. He was responding to the misery, the suffering of Rupa Goswami. Why? Because his suffering is not a prakrit chitta vikar. It's a manifestation of Swarup Shakti. So the devotee's happiness and distress are transcendental. And the Lord, who is the embodiment of transcendental compassion, responds to the transcendental suffering of his devotee. Therefore, hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. So now... Thus, both the happiness and distress of the devotees are manifestations of bhakti, which is Krishna's Swarup Shakti and is non-different from Krishna. <clears throat> now if you say, now someone may make an objection, the Purva Pakshin, he'll say, well wait a minute, that's not true, I've read the Bhagavatam. <laughs> huh? And in Sri Man Bhagavatam it says that Gajendra the elephant was being munched on by a crocodile. <coughs> right? The crocodile attacked him and was pulling him into the river and they were going backwards and forwards for thousands of years. And then when Gajendra was suffering completely and he was about to die, 
and he was in pain and the crocodile was about to kill him. The Supreme Lord appeared there and killed the crocodile with his chakra. So that shows you that when you're suffering, then God comes and saves you. Uh -huh. And I read it in the Bhagavatam. Grantaraj <laughs> Srimad Bhagavatam. So the answer is no. <laughs> Bhagavan did not appear out of empathy because Gajendra was suffering. What really happened? Gajendra, who was he in his previous life? King Indrajumna, right? And he made Aparad to, uh, who was it? Agastya Rishi. Hmm? So he made Aparad and his suffering was the reaction for that Vaishnava Aparad. Actually. So that when he was suffering for like a thousand years or whatever, the Lord didn't come. That was just he was suffering for his Vaishnava Aparad. But then what happened? When the effect of his Aparad wore off, then the impressions of Bhakti from his previous life manifested. And he took shelter of the Supreme Lord. He surrendered. With great humility. And then the Lord responded to his, the, the Bhakti which had just appeared. And then when Gajendra saw the Lord coming, flying in the sky in the back of Garuda, he grabbed a lotus flower and held it up to offer to the Lord. That's the actual sequence of events. Because what we think was, he was suffering, and then he grabbed the lotus flower and offered it to the Lord. Then the Lord came to get his lotus flower. It wasn't like that. What actually happened was, he was suffering, that was his apparat. When the apparat effect came to an end, then the samskar of bhakti from his previous life manifested. And then in great humility he surrendered to the Lord. Then the Lord appeared and then he took a flower and said, Oh, Aisha, Pushpanjali. Like that. So that's what happened. Therefore, the Lord was moved by compassion due to dainyatmaka bhakta bhakti anubhav. The Lord was Bhakti Anubhav realizing the devotion of the Danyatmak Bhakta, the devotee who was in a state of extreme dinata, feeling, I am so wretched, I am so fallen, I am so useless, I am so offensive. So Bhakti was there and great humility. So the Supreme Lord especially responds to that devotion, which is Danyatmak. The Danyatmak Bhakta, Bhakti Anubhav. So, again, if one were to say that it was the material suffering of Gajendra caused by the bite of the crocodile was the reason for Bhagwan's <coughs> compassion, then uh, the entire suffering of all worldly existence would have been uprooted by now. Same argument as before. So, now, someone can say, well, look, Krishna gave mercy to the Yamal Arjuna trees, right? Nalukuver and Manigrive. Uh, were standing in the form of Yamal Arjuna trees. Krishna gave mercy to them. They were suffering. Uh, so the answer is this. Uh, because someone can say, they were suffering in the form of trees and they had no bhakti. Mm? So Krishna, in that case, he couldn't have responded to their bhakti. He must have responded to their suffering. Mm? And the answer is no. He responded to bhakti. But not their bhakti. Nard Muni's bhakti. It was Narad who cursed them, but then gave them a blessing. After 100 years of standing of trees, then Krishna will be, give mercy to you. So because Krishna only inter, interacts with his Swarup Shakti, in this case, he's interacting with the Bhakti of Narad, not with the suffering of Nalukavar and Manigri. Now one could say that Bhagavan is biased if he feels the happiness and distress of the devotee. Uh, and then neglects them and gives attention to someone else. That would be bias. Right? Because first the person is saying, well, why is he biased towards his devotee? And we're saying, no, if he neglected the devotee and gave mercy to someone else, then he would be biased. Right? Because God is like a kalpataru, a desire-fulfilling tree. If anyone approaches... Um, uh, uh, the Kalpataru, the desire-fulfilling tree, the tree will reciprocate with them. One cannot say that the tree is biased for not reciprocating to those who don't approach the tree. Mm. Understand? Right? You cannot say, this, this, this the Kalpa Vriksha is completely biased. <laughs> huh? Because he didn't give any gifts to that guy over there. 
No. Anyone who approaches the tree, he'll give them what they want. So, God's favoritism to his devotee is not bias. Huh? Just because he doesn't, he's not giving things to the people who don't approach him, doesn't mean, yeah, he's, he's not biased. Those who approach him, he reciprocates with them and not with others. Not because he's biased against them, but because they don't approach him. Like that. So in this way, the apparent bias of the Supreme Lord is not bias at all. So there's no fault in him. Hmm? Now, Krishna himself has said, Yes, I favor my devotee. Samo ham sarvabhu chesyu, name dves chosti na priya, ye bhajanti tamam bhaktya maite chi shuchapya ham. Krishna said, I am equal to everyone. I don't favor anyone. I am not against anyone. But one who renders service to me, he is in me. Hmm? He always resides in me. And I reside in him. Hmm? So, that though Krishna said, I am partial to my devotee, it's not a fault of partiality because Krishna is like a desire tree. It, the desire tree cannot bl be blamed for being partial to those who take shelter. Because those who don't come, that's their, that was their uh, choice. So, now, oh, it's quite late. And there's a thousand different points. So what I want to come to <coughs> what should we do? <laughs> we have time? You have time? Yeah. Do you want to go? Okay. I'll, I'll do as best as we can. <coughs> Let's see. Now, now, here's a very important question. If Krishna performs his pastimes only with his devotees and with his Swarup Shakti, why does he take assistance from the demigods? Yeah, we see in the churning of the ocean of milk, he along with the, the demigods, they're churning together. Also we see that before Krishna appeared in this world, the demigods prayed and Krishna told them, as a Kiridakashai Vishnu sent a message to them. Soon, Supreme Lord Krishna will appear in the world and you should take birth among the Yadu dynasty and assist him in his pastime. So these demigods who were given that message and given that mission take birth now on earth among the human beings in the Vrishni dynasty, in the Yadu dynasty to assist the Supreme Lord. They were not transcendental pure devotees. They were just, they were sattvic uh, demigods. So, if the Supreme Lord, when He comes in this world to do His Leela, takes assistance from the demigods, that means that He's dependent. He's not Swarat. He's not independent. And the answer is this. No. Krishna is completely independent. Why? Because when He does His Leela, and interacts. What to speak of interacting with demigods, even interacting with the demons. For the purpose of his Leela, a portion of his Shakti enters into them and he interacts with his own Shakti only. But the common person cannot see it. They see he's interacting with Tamasic demons and Rajasic demons and Satic demigods. But actually, he appears and his Shakti enters into them and he's only interacting with his own Shakti. Then someone says, but wait a minute. If his Shakti enters into them, why is it not visible? Why don't we know that? Why are we not aware of that? <coughs> you see, we just heard this morning that the, the, about the churning of the ocean of milk. Right? So you're thinking the Lord is Ajit's over here and the demons are over there and the demigods are over there. So the Lord has come and He's interacting with this world. But the answer is no. 
a portion of his chakti is entered into everyone who's there and he's only interacting with his own energy. This is the to understand the Leela of the churning of the ocean of milk in Tattva. To understand the Leela. Janma Kama Chamedi Vyam Evam Yoveti Tattvata. The things that I'm doing, my karma, my Leela activity, you have to know it in Tattva. So, we compare the Lord to our... If we go somewhere, we just go there and we interact with everyone. Lord is not like that. When He goes there, He's still only interacting with His Swarup Shakti. Now, why can't you see that? In the seventh canto, Shukadev Goswami gives the answer. <clears throat> 7119. He says, The meaning is, Bhagavan appears like light and other elements and thus he cannot be discerned from the bodies of the devas and the asuras but only the wise after careful deliberation tattva vichar come to understand how the supreme self situates himself in those individual selves so now the example is given that Bhagavan appears like light and other elements undetected within those personalities, the demons and demigods. So the, uh, the, this example means this. <clears throat> Let's say you look and you see a pot. Right? You see a pot. And you say, oh, this pot is red. Uh, right? It is this particular color. Uh, or you see a drum and someone beats the drum you say this drum makes a deep sound right now the question is this what is the pot made of earth earth right and how do you detect earth by fragrance so the, the sense object which reveals the presence of earth is fragrance but you're saying the pot is red. Which element reveals the uh, shape or form? No, that's the sense. Which element? Fire. The, f the, the, the fire element, its subtle cause is the tan matra, the sense object form. Like that. So you say this pot made of earth is red. But actually, the earth is not red because the quality of earth is only is fragrance. And the form is coming from fire. But because all the earth, water, fire, air and so on are mixed together there, you think that the, that the, the element of earth is producing the perception of form. But it's not. The element of fire is producing the perception of form. Similarly, you say, this drum produces a deep sound. Right? So the drum is made of earth. Right? But where does sound come from? Akash, space, right? So the drum, which is made of earth, is not producing the sound. It's the element Akash is which is producing the sound. But because Akash, the five elements are mixed together in the object, you are saying that the drum is producing the sound. Like that. So in this, but a person who has Tattva Gyan understands how this works. But the common person is confused. So Shukadev Goswami here in the seventh canto is saying, in the same way, people look and think the Lord comes to this world and he's interacting with everyone. But actually, it's his own Shakti, portions of his own Shakti which has entered into everyone and he's interacting with that and you are thinking he's interacting with Tamagun and Rajagun and Satvagun. But he never does. Huh? Nice example. Did you know that that verse was in Bhagavatam? So Bhagavatam, there are 18,000 verses in Bhagavatam and they all have wonderful mysteries in them. So, so Dhammadaka Swami said, Jaha Bhagavata Pada Vaishnava Stane. If you want to understand what's really going on in this text, Srimad Bhagavatam, take shelter of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the devotees in his Anugatya, then we can have some idea of what it is. Otherwise, if we just read, then, oh, very difficult. Therefore, Nityam Bhagavata Seva, one must serve the book Bhagavatam and the devotee Bhagavatam in order to get the benefit. So, <coughs> now, a question comes. Doesn't Krishna punish the miscreants? 
Isn't that reverse partiality? Vinashyam Duskritam? The answer is that it only appears that he's punishing the miscreants. But he's not actually. He's purifying them. Eh? Krishna doesn't kill demons. He purifies them. Hmm? You see? If someone has jaundice and you give candy to them, it tastes really bitter. But giving that candy is actually the cure. So to give candy to a person with jaundice isn't a punishment. Eh? It's a cure for them. So, in this way, uh, Krishna kills the demons only to save his devotees actually but he's not against them because he's, he's liberating them so now a very deep Leela Tattva comes we just, we just started now we're going to go deeply into Leela Tattva uh, so when you hear Leela you'll never see it the same ever again when Krishna comes in this world it looks like he's under the jurisdiction of material energy. Hmm? Right? Because what happens? In this material energy, we have time. Time is moving. And so we do activities, and the activities have results, and we call that karma. Right? If you don't take a bath, it won't smell so good. If you do take a bath, it won't smell so bad. Like that. So there's a time when you wake up, don't smell so good. And then the next moment you get in the shower and you take a bath and then after that then you feel you, uh, you're hungry and then you eat the food and then you're full. Like that. And so all karma, all activities have a sequence of time. So when Krishna comes into this world it looks like he's doing karma. Janma karma tamedivya. Uh, it looks like he's doing... Because his activities have a sequence of time which is causal and if he doesn't do certain things, he won't get the result. And if he does do certain things, he does get a result. Just like everyone else. And as we know, material time is just a product of the gunas. So doesn't it mean that Krishna acting within the flow of time, either getting results by doing things or not getting results by not doing things, isn't he involved in the gunas? Hmm? Uh, Mayavadis will say the truth is nirgon, so, so it must just be a light which is niskriya. Actionless, it has no action. And as soon as you come here and start doing activities, all types of duality, past, present, future, cause and effect and everything, all come into play. So how can Krishna's karma be divya, transcendental? For example, not only that, but in Krishna's Leela, demons come and they oppose him. Just like we heard, Shalva, Shalva shot an arrow. And he hit the arm of Krishna and Krishna dropped his bow. Right? And then Krishna retaliated and hit him with a club with the other hand. There in Shwaibanalp we told the pastimes of Shalva. And then, oh you missed the end of that one. End was very important. So then Krishna hit him with a club and then he was trembling and vomiting blood. And then he disappeared and he came back with Vasudev Maharaj. And said, I've captured your father. And then he cuts off Vasudev Maharaj's head and Krishna's crying. <laughs> and then later Krishna discovers that actually it was an illusion because Shalva has all these mystic powers and Vasudev Maharaj was still safe and being protected by Balaram in the city. But at that time Shalva was bombing. He had like a death star, you know. He had this huge spaceship and he was dropping bombs and, 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 and the city of Dwarka, Damna, Swayna, Sada, Nirasta, Kokam, the Dam, the buildings and parks and and palaces of Dwarka were being smashed by the bombs. Really? So how can you say that all oh, Krishna's Leela is transcendental? When demons are coming and, and making destruction, chaos, Krishna sometimes being defeated. The devotees are sometimes being defeated. There's some devotees captured and put in prison. Jarasandha captured so many kings who were devotees and put them in prison. You remember? And um, Jarasandha was also smashing the walls of Mathura was a very critical situation and uh, Krishna is also he wakes up and he feels hungry and then he eats and then he feels full and he's also washing and fighting and so on so in many ways the activities of Krishna and his devotees they just seem like karmas so how can you tell this is all Swarup Shakti so the answer is this that the Swarup Shakti is beyond the influence of Maya. 
But when Krishna comes into this world, Maya, the material energy which is here, acts in such a way that gives the impression that Krishna's Leela is controlled by Maya. But actually what happens is, the material energy comes in synchronization with the Swarup Shakti. There's a synchronization of the material energy in this world with the Swarup Shakti. So, the example is given of Shakun. You know, Shakun means an omen. An omen is synchronized with an event, but it's not the cause of the event. You see? It's just like someone might be going somewhere and they think, I'm hoping this is my lucky day, I hope I'll be successful. And then they shriek because they see a black cat. And they think, oh no, a black cat. Now everything's going to go wrong. Damn that cat. I curse you, cat. And they blame the cat for spoiling their day. Right? Now, an omen, an omen is not the cause. Your karma is the cause of the happiness or distress or the success or failure. The omen is, is not instrumental in the result. It's just indicative of the result. So in the same way, when Krishna comes to this world and there are all these material beings doing this and that and things are unfolding, you know, because, you know, there's so much, when Krishna comes to this world, then the whole world is involved. The demigods are involved, the demons are involved, there are kings and rishis and all different people in different modes. They're all involved. But what happens? The material energy that they're under synchronizes with the Swarup Shakti that everyone acts in such a way that the Leela is going on according to the will of the Lord and full of Rasa. And therefore, the actions of those who are affected by the Gunas in Krishna's Leela is not instrumental in any way in the Leela. It's just indicative, like Shakun. So this is some Leela Tattva. Leela Tattva. Now, sometimes Maya cannot synchronize with the Leela. Because the Leela, something fantastic happens and Maya just can't do that. So the example is given. We told the history in Shwaibhanaup, the pastime, of when <coughs> Krishna graduated from Gurukul and Sandipani Muni asked for Dakshina. So he cons Sandipani, Muni, Sandipani Muni consulted with his wife and they decided, as Dakshina, can you please bring back our son? So Krishna went, they'd lost, the, the sun had disappeared in the ocean. So Krishna goes to the ocean and the, the, the demigod of the ocean tells Krishna that actually the son of Sandipani Muni was eaten by a demon named Shankasur. Right? Shankasur. Sankachuta is another demon. So, Shankachuta is the one from whom Krishna took the Shamataka money. And Shankasur is... Is is his name actually Panchajan, Panchajan, and he took the conch shell from him, so his conch shell is called Panchajanya. Okay, so yes, all the Mahabharata enthusiasts jump for joy. So what happened was, then Krishna had to go to the abode of Yamaraj, right, and he asked for the sun back. So the problem was that the sun had already been digested by the enzymes in the stomach of. Uh, Panchajan. And so it was impossible to get the son back in the same form that would be recognizable by his parents. Uh, so, you know, it, the parents wouldn't be happy if Krishna said, well, here's your son, and gave them some pre-digested, <laughs> whatever. So, so at that time, because Maya could not synchronize with the Swarup Shakti, the Swarup Shakti just manifested the same form as the sun as he appeared, as he looked when he had disappeared from the parents. And Yamaraj gave him back and Krishna happily brought him back on the chair and gave him to his parents. And Sandipanu Muni and his wife were very, were very happy. So, it's understood that whenever the Maya Shakti is unable to become a Shakun and synchronize with the desire of Krishna uh, manifest by the Swarup Shakti, then the Swairata or the independence of Swarup Shakti becomes revealed. The Swarup Shakti is always independent. The Leela seems to be dependent on Maya because of the synchronization. But the actual independence of the Swarup Shakti is manifest when the Maya Shakti cannot keep up with the Leela. 
and the example is the return of the digested sun of <laughs> Sunday <Sunday Pernamoni. laughs> So. Uh, let's see. Now, oh, this is a very interesting point. If someone goes against Krishna's devotees, Krishna becomes angry with them. So that person who's going against the devotee is in the gunas, right? So if Krishna responds to to the person in the gunas and becomes angry with that person, now isn't hasn't Krishna become entangled in the gunas, right? And the answer is no. He's because Krishna's anger with that person who's against his devotee gives Krishna great pleasure because it's an expression of love for his devotee. So when Krishna becomes angry with the demon, uh, you know, Hiranyakashipu terrorized the universe but Krishna did nothing. When Hiranyakashipu tried to kill Prahlad, then Lord Nishingadev appeared and he was angry. Right? So it's not that the Lord is involved in the gunas because of the tamasic behavior of that demon. But rather, his anger is the expression of love for his devotee, so that anger is Swarup Shakti and gives him pleasure. So, then the question comes, that what happens if a, dev if a demon becomes offensive to a devotee, Krishna becomes angry, and he kills them, and Krishna gets pleasure from that anger because it's love. But what happens if a devotee becomes offensive to a more advanced devotee? What will happen then? So, the answer is that if a devotee makes offense to a great saint, then first the reaction will come. And the reaction is, he becomes full of hate for the Vaishnavas and Krishna. Hmm? So those who hate Vaishnavas and go against Vaishnavas, uh, it may be that they themselves were vi devotees before who advanced to a certain point and then made offense. And then the reaction is that you become filled with hatred for devotees and even for Krishna. And so one becomes demonic, it seems. And that hatred blazes for a long time like Bardavanal. Bardavanal is a sub-aquatic volcano. We discussed that the other day in, in regard to the, uh, the analogy of the endless arguments of the Mimangsakas. But then what happens, after a long time of suffering in that state of hatred, being against devotees and against Krishna, gradually that reaction of the Aparad wears off. And then, the devotee, that person comes in contact with Krishna and his devotees again. And the reaction for the offense is completely destroyed. And then, that person is accepted by Krishna and he goes to the spiritual world. The devotees do not obtain Brahma Sayuja like the demons. You see? Demons can go against the devotees and Krishna kills them and they get Brahma Sayuja. But when a devotee goes against a more advanced devotee, then Krishna doesn't give them Sayuja, Brahma Sayuja. Why not? And the answer is this. If they suffer due to the Aparad, then again they meet Krishna and the devotees and become free from the Aparad and then they get bhakti and they go to the spiritual world. They do not get Brahma Sayuja because the bhakti lata beach is indestructible. This is the tattoo here. This is so. Once you've received the bhakti lata beach by Vaishnava association, even if you become a demon for so many lifetimes, Krishna will not kill you and put you in Brahman like he does with the regular demons. Uh, but rather, you'll, become, you'll suffer, become freed from the offense, again attain association, go to the <coughs> spiritual world, and the reason for that is because that seed that Sadhu Sangha gave you, that Guru gave you, that Bhakti Lata Beach, is indestructible. Haribo! Uh -huh. Now, also this happens when the devotee is not initiated, it means one who has Bhakti Lata Beach. So whether they have initiation or not initiated, it means one who has received the Bhakti Lata Beach. So, now, another Leela Tattwa. Is the Leela of Krishna under the control of time? Because what happened in the churning of the ocean of milk? The, the, in the universe, 
Rajagun became prominent and the demigods were displaced. And the Supreme Lord said, now you can't do anything. You can't do anything. So you have to make a truce and wait until when Sattva becomes prominent, then you'll be in the ascendant position. So, from this pastime of the churning of the ocean of milk, it seems that the Lord's Leela is under the control of time. So he said, you can't do anything now. Rajas is prominent. You will have to make a truce. Bide your time until you get into a more powerful position. Hmm? So, the answer is this. That, when the Lord comes here, He is the... Swarup Shakti acts in such a way that the material energy, which is like the Abbas Briti, the shadow of Swarup Shakti, is conforming to that. And he plays along as if his Leela is subject to time. He's playing along with that. So, sometimes we see that Krishna is. We just gave the example, he was shot in the arm, he dropped his bow, his father was kidnapped, it looked, and he became saddened by that. So sometimes, Krishna and his devotees, there's a battle and they're losing and so on. Why does that happen? That is only for the Vajitrata, the variety of the Leela. Because in a drama, you know, for writing a drama, there are some rules of drama. There has to be a bij. The bij is the seed of desire. The hero has a desire. And that sends the, sets the whole drama in motion. And so then there has to be bindu. That means drops. That means incidents which fall upon him. Which causes the desire to grow and grow and grow. Hmm? But then in a drama. These are the different components which have to be there in a drama. The hero has to meet with an obstacle. Hmm? And then he meets with the obstacle. And becomes completely defeated and totally hopeless. And all hope is lost. Hmm? But then, suddenly, something happens that gives him hope. That he can be successful. And then he tries again and he's successful. So, that the, in a drama, the success of the hero in the end is amazing. It surprises everyone. But it only surprises everyone because he struggled and struggled and went to the pits of despair. And it looked like there was no chance. And then it turned around. And the cavalry arrived, you know, like that, whatever. <laughs> so, this is Prakrit Rasa, but the transcendental Rasa also has those ingredients. So when the, the time seems like the Tamas is winning, the Rajas is winning, the Sattva is losing, he's not really under the control of the Gunas and not under the control of time, but the material energy is conforming to his desire of the Swarup Shakti, and this is just creating the drama and the ras because Madbhaktanam Vinodatam. All this drama is just to give pleasure to the devotees, that they can all taste rasa. So, now the question comes what is time? Right? Because Krishna appears on time. He appears at the end of the Dwapa Yuga at the 28th millennium of Vaivasvata Manu, once in a day of Lord Brahma. Uh, so what is this time? So, there are two perspectives on time. The first perspective is that time is the Vritti Vishesh of Maya. It's a special function of Maya. In particular, when the three Gunas, which are in equilibrium, the equilibrium of the Gunas is broken, and Rajagun begins to make action, movement, motion, then the motion of the material energy is experienced by us as material time. And therefore time is called Tatkal Anugun. Anugun means here like the word Anu, Britya Anubritya. Anubritya means the servant of a servant. Anubritya, so here Anugun means the time is a... Uh, a byproduct of the it's a quality, it's a goon which is following the gunas so when the gunas move everything moves and we experience that as time, okay, so that's the first conception of time it's a vritti vishesh of maya, a special function of the gunas of maya, but when Devaki prayed to Krishna when Krishna appeared 
now we're going to celebrate Janmashtami. So in the third chapter of the tenth canto, Devaki says, Yo yam kalas tasya te vyaktam bando chestam mahus chestate yena vishvam vinimesha di vatsaranto mahiyams tam tveshanam kshema dhama prapadde O friend of the avyakta, the unmanifest, this wonderful creation works under the control of powerful time, which is divided into nanoseconds, seconds, minutes, hours and years. This element of time is your cheshta. Cheshta means a volitional act. You will, you will something and it happens. That's that cheshta, a volitional act. You are the reservoir of all good fortune. Let me offer my full surrender to you. So here we see that two conceptions of time are given. The time which is broken into sections, nanoseconds, minutes, hours, years, and so on, that is the kandita kal, time which is broken into parts, that is kal, tatkal anugun, that is material time, that is the vritti vishesh, a special function of maya. But she said, my lord, this time is your cheshta, it's your volitional act. So time can be seen in two ways. There's the will of the Lord and then there's the movement of the gunas which conforms to the will of the Lord when He appears and that is experienced in uh, seconds, broken moments. So we say Krishna appeared whatever 5,000 years ago. He was here for 125 years and then He left. But actually the, the activity which is the volitional act of Krishna which is the Swarup Shakti every moment is eternal. And so a devotee now in his meditation can say, Oh, Krishna is just lifting Govardhan Hill now. Hmm? So these two aspects are there of time. There is the volitional act of Krishna, which is of Swarup Shakti and the expression of his will. And that, uh, and the Maya, which is the abbas of that vritti, the shadow of that vritti, conforms to it. And that is experienced as material time by those who are in the Lila who themselves are in Maya. So therefore it says, Shristi stiti pralaya sadhana shakti eka chayeva yasya bhuvanani bibhati bhura ichana rupam api yasya tachesta tesa govindam adipurajam tamamajam All the components are in that verse. That maya is the abhas, it is the chaya, the shadow of the will of the Lord, the eacher of the Lord. Uh, and it is cheshta, like that. So... Also in the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Kalos me lok shaya krit pravido. I am time, the great destroyer of the worlds. Kapil Dev in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam says, Yaha kala pancha vimsaka prabhavam paurusham prahu. Means that all the elements of Prakriti are mixed together by the 25th element, time. So here, Kapil Dev includes time as a material element that mixes the other elements together. But then he says, Prabhavam Paurusham. It is the Prabhav of the Purush. It is the influence of the Transcendental Lord. So again, just as Devaki has given two elements, two perspectives on time, Lord Kapil Dev also gives these two perspectives on time. So though these two are different, because they're synchronized with each other, ultimately it's one. And it's up to you which way you see things. Hmm? So, to summarize, we can say that the mukya pravriti, that means the primary function of time, is that is the influence of Krishna's will. It is his chesta. It is the purush prabhav. Hmm? And, therefore, the mukya pravriti, the primary influence of time, is what? Bhaktavinodaya. It's just to please the devotee. Hmm? So when you look at the watch and you see the finger going, tick, 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 why is he doing that? That's Krishna making that happen just to please the devotee. Hmm? Time is Krishna's will and the only purpose is to please the devotee. Why? Because with time, the devotee's devotion grows. It becomes ruchi, asakti, bhav, prem, and stay like that. And so, time is there just for the expansion of the joy of the devotee. Huh? So that is the mukya praviti. 
It is bhakta vinodaya for the pleasure of the devotee. And the secondary function of time is called gun udboda. Time awakens the, the, the gunas. So the activation of the gunas occurs automatically. So what you have here is the transcendental time is to give the mukhya pravritti is to give happiness to the devotees. And the secondary function of that transcendental time is that it does gun udbhava. It awakens the gunas. And then the movement of the gunas produces what we experience as material time, which is khandit, broken into portions of past, present and future. Like that. So, the material time is the praviti abhas. That is the semblance of the mukya praviti, the main function which is the will of the Lord to please His devotees. Now, from, now from this analysis of time, we come to some wonderful, wonderful conclusions and that is expressed in our verse for the day. Our verse for today is Shumat Bhagavatam. Do we have another torch? Someone can shine here. I can shine there. So our verse for today, another, a jewel, an absolute jewel of Srimad Bhagavatam. And this will make sure you're sitting comfortably, not perhaps not standing up, you may faint and fall over. We don't want devotees to be injured when you, when you understand the meaning of this verse, which is the conclusion of all this. Huh? Seventh Canto, chapter 1, verse 10. Yada sa srikshu pura atmana puro Raja srijati shaprithak swamayaya Satvam vichitra surirang suriswara Sa yasyamana sthama iryati aso Translation When the Supreme Lord, that is para, the end of the last line, para, the Supreme Lord, He desires to create. Sisrikshuhu. Sisrikshuhu means one who is desiring hmm, to create. Like a jigyasu is one who desires to know. Sisrikshuhu means one who desires to create. So, yada, when the Supreme Lord desires to create pura. The word pura means body. Hmm, he dis wants to make pura. Create the bodies, atmana, for the living entities. In other words, this is talking about when the universe is dissolved, it's during the time of the pralai, right? There's no material world. Then, when the Lord desires to create bodies for the souls, then what does He do? He, rajas rijati eisha pritak swamayaya. His maya, which is one, becomes pritak, divided. He inspires rajagun, and the equilibrium of the gunas is broken and rajas becomes pro predominant and creation takes place. Rajas rajat isha pritak swamayaya swamaya by his maya. Now, satvam vichitrasu vichitra means vichitrasu is locative plural in the various forms that he creates for the living entities rirangsur ishwara when God wants to uh, play with them, then he makes sattva. In other words, he the universe is maintained. It's created, then it's maintained, and uh, God's interaction with his devotees in the world takes place so many pastimes. And then, shayishamanas, when the Lord wants to rest, <laughs> then, tama iratya so, then he inspires tamagun, and the universe is dissolved, and that's the end of that particular cycle of creation. And then there's the, the pralai is like goes on for a long time. And then when he wants to create the universe again, Yada Sishikshu, he wants to make the bodies again for the living beings, like that. So that's the general meaning of the verse. And perhaps that might be a verse that you might just skip over or think it's not very important or even fall asleep while you're reading that verse. And, right? Now, what does it really mean? The deep meaning of this is Yada Sisikshu Pura Atmana Pura The Lord wants to make bodies for the living entities. Now, we've just been discussing that the Lord only interacts with His internal potency. 
He doesn't interact with the non-devotees. He's not concerned. He has no realization of their happiness and distress. Right? So then why will the Lord want to create the world to give bodies? Like the world is dissolved. All the jivas are asleep within the body of Mahavishnu. Why will he suddenly desire to give them bodies? Because they're indifferent to him. And he's not thinking of them. He only interacts with his internal potency. So, our Acharyas have explained. The only way we can explain this is that the word Pura, body, means Sadaka Rup. He wants to make the bodies of his devotees. In other words, in the, at the time of the last annihilation, there were devotees who are Sadakas. And those Sadakas had progressed to a certain level of devotion. And Bhakti had entered into their hearts. But they had not become perfect yet. They were not ready to be transferred to the spiritual world. Their sadha had not become perfect. So, yeah, yes. So, bhakti yoga, that is. So, the Supreme Lord is impelled by their devotion. He thinks, let me give them sadhak forms so that they can serve. And let me fulfill their desire to progress and become perfect in devotion. And therefore, the Supreme Lord breaks the equilibrium of Prakriti and the whole universe comes into existence. What is the cause of the entire universe? The devotee of the sadhakas. Huh? Huh? The devotion of the sadhakas. That's the cause of the entire universe. You see? Sometimes... Being in India, it's different because in Vrindavan, practically everyone's a devotee. But when you live in the West, sometimes you may feel a little bit discouraged by the fact that you've joined this minority sect. Right? <laughs> Don't feel like that. Why? Because you're not a member of a minority sect. In fact, the entire universe was, is manifest only for devotees. Not for any other reason. Hmm? This Shristi Leela, this creation Leela, is because those devotees who have advanced into the stages of Ruchi, Asakti, hmm? and some have come also to Bhav, hmm? and they're feeling separation from the Lord, and the Lord feels separation from for them, but they haven't come to complete perfection yet. And therefore, the Supreme Lord, feeling separation from them, He breaks the equilibrium of Prakriti and the whole universe manifests so that they can have a sadhak form and then he can in interact with them either directly or through the medium of his holy name and Harikatha and Srimad Bhagavatam and the deity and his other forms. Like that. So, the cause of all existence is only the devotees. Hmm? But, because there are so many other living entities are there as well. Incidentally, the world is created, maintained and destroyed. Incidentally. But the primary cause is just the love of the devotee for the Lord and the, and the Lord's uh, love for His devotee. Now, someone may say, Paramatma is in everyone. Why does the Lord give special attention to the devotees? Yes, Paramatma is in the heart of everyone. But only the Paramatma is attached to those who are devotees. For example, if you're flying, soon many of you will be flying. So say you're flying to Russia or America or something. So I'll go to the Russia with Swarnalata. Someone will, when I arrive there, they say, Oh, who did you come with? I say, I came to Russia with Swarnalata. Uh, really? You will hire a private jet? No, I came on a jet with 250 people. So then why did I say I went with her? Because I had no attachment for them. Right? Huh? So you say that you're with someone when there's attachment. Others may be there. But if there's no attachment, you never say that you're with them. Even though you're with them. So in the same way, though guham pravisto atmanohi, there are two souls in the heart. Right? But, <laughs> there are two souls in the heart. But, Paramatma is only attached to those who are devotees. 
And so even though the Paramatma is in the heart of the non-devotees, it's as good as he's not being there. Just as there were other 200 people on the flight, but you say, I'm not with them. Right? And, that, and Krishna expresses that in Bhagavad Gita. Mayatadam idam sarvam jagat advyakta murtina matstani sarvabhutani nacham teshavastita. Krishna said that by me, in my unmanifested form, I pervade this whole universe. Matstani sarvabhutani. All living beings are in me, but I am not in them. Then Krishna said, Nacha matstani. And also, all beings are not in me. Pasyame yoga maishram. See my mystic opulence. So Krishna has said two things. All beings are in me. And he's also said, and all beings are not in me. What's the meaning? It means that for those who are not devotees, though the Paramatma is in their heart, it's as good as he's not being there. Because they have no attachment for him. Like a stranger sitting in another row on the airplane. Uh, right? So, because... The, the relationship of the Paramatma with the non-devotees is as good as not having a relationship at all. Therefore, we cannot say that the Supreme Lord creates the world to give bodies for the living beings. No. The cause of the creation of material existence is only the devotees. Therefore, the deciding factor, whether Ishwar is in the heart or not, is simply the attachment. Therefore, the desire to create the world does not originate in the Lord, but in the devotion of the devotee. The devotion in the heart of the devotee impels the Lord to create the world, to break the equilibrium of Prakriti, so that he can madbhaktanam vinodatam, so he can please that sadak by fulfilling his desire to go through the stages, ruchya, sakti, bhav, brain, and perfect his devotional service. So that's the meaning of life. That's why the world exists. That's why there are seven days in the week and 12 months in the year and, and 60 seconds in a minute. Hmm? Time, space, the world and everything is nothing but an exchange of love between Krishna and his devotees. And that's what it's for and nothing else. Uh, and incidentally, coincidentally, everything that you call history is going on. But the real news is only Bhakti. Go or pray, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the teaching in this Leela of the churning of the ocean of milk. How the Lord, even though He seems to be interacting, He seems to be under time, He seems to be partial, He seems to be doing karmas, He seems to be taking one side over another, He seems to be dependent, all these things are completely false. And when we understand that the Lord reacts interacts only with his Swarup Shakti, only with his devotees, only for the mercy of his devotees, in a completely independent way, then one may say, Janma Karma Chame Dibyam Eva Myo Tattvataha. That the Lord has compassion, but the compassion is only for the devotees. And it's that compassion which is the cause of all existence. Hmm? And when we understand that the Lord is completely free from any Maik Vikar, Vikar of Prakriti, He's Anandamoy, then you also become Anandamoy and completely free from the illusion of happiness and distress of this world. And therefore Krishna said, Janma Karma Chame Divyam Eva Myoveti Tattva Taha. When you know about my Leela in Tattva, the Leela Tattva, then you will not take birth again, but immediately upon knowing it, you come directly to me and you will be completely blissful forever. Chaudike Ananda Dekhi and see bliss, only bliss in every direction. Yat ka, uh, what is that verse? Vidima Indra Chista Vishwam Purna Sukhaya Te Vidima Indra Chista Chitaya Te Yat Karuna Kataksha Baiba Baba Tam Tam Gaura Mavas Tumaha Kaival Yam Narakaya Te Tu Kadasha Pura Kasha Pushpaya Te Dudan Tendri Akala Sapa Patali Prakata Dangstraya Te Vishwam Purna Sukhaya Te Vidima Indra Chista Chitaya Te Yat karunat kataksh vaiba bhavatam tam gaurum evas tumaha. Our favorite transcendental madman, Srila Prabodhananda Saswati, he said, When one receives the merciful sideline glance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then liberation seems like hell. 
going to heaven seems like uh, phantasmagoria, flowers in the sky. Mm? The, trying to control the, the senses which b give a great problem to the yogis who are doing yoga sadhana become like snakes which act but their teeth, poisonous teeth have been removed so they have no effect at all. Mm? All the great demigods like Indra and Brahma and others, they seem like insignificant insects. And the whole universe looks as, as if it's completely full of joy in all directions. This is the effect of the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So those who take shelter of Mahaprabhu, Yaha Bhagavata Pada Vaishnava Rastani Ekantara Shai Koru Chaitanya Tarani We take shelter of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by taking shelter of Bhakta Bhagavat, the Vaishnavas who are immersed in Srimad Bhagavatam. And in that way, by understanding the Leela Tattva, Janma Kama Tame Divyama Ivat Nuveti Tattva Taha, then all these benefits uh, the, of the merciful sidelong glance of Mahaprabhu, one becomes full of joy. He sees the universe full of joy. And sees the time, space, everything is only an expression of love. It isn't, don't think that the Leela, when the Leela is going on, then this, is, this time is transcendental and love. But in between the leelas of the Lord, there are thousands and thousands of years. All of that, everything, is only the expression of the love of Krishna for his devotee and the love of the devotee for Krishna. Gauru Prema. And the churning of the churning of milk, where are the, which devotees is it? Which devotees are there? Because there are devotees among the devotees. It wasn't for all the devatas, but there are devotees among the devatas. We mentioned when we told that Lord Brahma is a pure devotee. So it was, it was Brahma who, the, the devatas first went to him, then then Brahma took them to the ocean of milk, and then they prayed, and then, like that. <coughs> it's not evam yo anubhav. So all the devotees who have heard you today, they know it now. <laughs> well, you know, Veti means no, but when you know it, Tattvataha, that means Anubhav. Uh, Tattvata doesn't mean theory, it means actually. But there's a very important meaning to this word Tattvataha. Uh, when you see in the Upanishads this word Tat, Tat, it means Parabrahma, the absolute truth, the supreme highest truth, Tat. Mm? So, Tat Vigyana Tam Sagaru Meva Abhigachet. If you want to know Tat, Om Tat Sat. So, tat means the absolute truth. So, when Krishna said, Janma kama tame divyam evam yoveti tattvataha, what he means to say is that when you know that my birth and my activities are tat. In other words, don't think there's God and he comes in this world and does karma. Huh? But God is tat, the absolute truth, and God is non different from his name. Non different from his roop, non different from his goon, non different from his leela. So, as God is tat, his leela is tat. So, therefore, his janma is tat, his karma is tat. And that's the meaning. Janma, karma. One who knows that my janma, my birth, and my activities, they are tat. They are that supreme truth described in the Vedas. In other words, that whole nam, roop, goon, leela, everything, that taken together, that is tat, the supreme absolute truth. Then one who realizes that, he, he doesn't take birth again, but as soon as he realizes, Krishna said he comes to me. In other words, he will have a spurti of the beautiful smiling form of Shama Sunda and interact with him at the time of chanting Harinam and serving the deity and so on. So now it's very late. Tomorrow morning we'll have Mangal Artik, we'll chant some Japa together. I'll talk to the devotees who haven't been able to speak to yet. And then at, by 10.30 I have to set off down the hill. Otherwise I'll miss my flight from uh, Milan to Moscow. Uh, so that's our festival for this year. I want to say a great, uh, express my appreciation, my gratitude to Krishna Chandra for all. <laughs> who is very loving and affectionate to all the devotees and always trying to make wonderful arrangements for the auspiciousness of their life. So we are, I am very grateful to my dear, dear God-brother, Krishna Chandra Prabhu. And I'm also uh, grateful to all the residents of the ashram and also the, those who are not residents of the ashram but those who were cooking. Who was the cooking department? 
What about Shruti, Shruti Murti did something? Shruti Mukha. Shruti Mukha Prabhu Ki! And Krishna Chan was cooking also. And I know so many devotees were serving in so many capacities. So I am very grateful to you all. And I pray that we can meet again very soon in Braja for Braj Mandal Parakrama or Navadip Dham Parakrama or Jagannath Puri Parakrama. And together we can glorify the holy name Srimad Bhagavatam and her Guru Parampara. And by that, please see Krishna and attain perfection of our life. Go to pray, Mother.